One of the things I really miss about the early days of role-playing game commentary and discussion on YouTube is the video response function. Its removal has, in a sense, crippled our online video sharing community and lessened our ability to make a direct connection with other channels and, and other content producers. It's a shame. Of course, the video response is not is not dead, it's just a little more awkward than it was before. We have to use other online media such as Facebook or G Plus to, to share links and advise people that we have made a response. YouTube comments being as useless as they are. So, recently, Tim Harper, Sam Y7 RPG for his channel, has posted a list of 13 questions that he would like the role-playing game community to respond to, to help him you know, prepare for a paper that he would like to write. A paper on role-playing games. And I'm not totally happy with the direction some of the questions take, but I will answer them and you know, provide commentary as requested uh, to explain my reaction to the questions. Like I said, there are 13 questions, and we'll go through them one at a time. First answer, or the first question, is can you please describe in detail any negative situations that came about in your life because you played role-playing games? And then he gives some suggestions, such as being bullied or belittled. Uh, he also references the satanic panic of the 80s, where a lot of parents were advised by uh, you know, parental advice groups or by school boards and things like this, that the specific game Dungeons & Dragons uh, should not be allowed in their home, that it, it was irresponsible. It led to um, teenage experimentation with things that they couldn't understand. Uh, it had kids becoming obsessed with imagination and whatnot, rather than focusing on things which are more important. Um, now, of course, we recognize that the satanic panic was a load of crap, and many parents, including my own, my parents uh, forbade me from playing role-playing games. This is one of the few times that I, I openly rebelled uh, against, you know, <laughs> what they wanted. And the result of that rebellion was actually quite positive. It, it, it formalized a process of discussion between me as a child becoming, becoming an adult with my parents about decisions and why I was making decisions and why they were making decisions and both sides learning to understand who was right or what was more right in a situation. So even that small negative of being forbidden from engaging in an activity which has been nothing but positive for me, um, learning why they thought it would be a negative and seeing them recognize through my description of the hobby that they were wrong and apologize for it has has been nothing but positive their fear well i guess we can learn to appreciate as we get older we can learn to appreciate a parent's fear for their child well out in the world out among my peers did this cause any negatives that I was a gamer. Well, I was just as much, well, slightly more of an isolationist then than I am now. And not only did I likely not tell anybody other than the people that I gamed with that I was a gamer, their opinion wouldn't have mattered to me at all. <laughs> so I didn't I didn't have that experience that I've heard other gamers talk about about being picked on or teased for playing Dungeons and Dragons. I've never really associated it with that. As an adult, I've gotten more teasing for still being a gamer than I than I did uh, as a teen. And of course, as an adult, I still don't care what people think. So in the end, the, the end sum of things is that there have been far more positives associated with being a gamer than negatives. And direct reactions to my being a gamer uh, have really amounted to nothing more from my perspective than banter. Question number two. 
What skills do you think you have personally improved upon by playing role-playing games? <laughs> I have it on good authority that I was a pretty outgoing child. But as I got closer and closer to my teenage years and as I passed through my teen years, I very much withdrew from everybody and everything. I had very few friends. I was the sort of, of teen that had one friend and my family moved a lot. So that one friend would become zero friends and then one friend again. That kind of thing. And I was the sort of person who would prefer the company of a book to pretty much anything or anyone else. Being introduced by one of my friends to role-playing games and being encouraged by that friend in my participation and seeing the effect that the games that I ran had on other players. These are the things I would say that kept me from completely withdrawing into the darkness. You know, that there is light at all, that there is connection at all uh, between me and a wider group of people is tied nearly 100% to the introduction to role-playing games. Everything else I did in my life from, you know, traveling to Asia, exploring the martial arts, teaching the martial arts, sharing about that, and continuing in the industry that I have, have made my career. These are all connected to the communication abilities that we must have in order to play a role-playing game, the willingness to explore empathy from other points of view, to understand why someone is doing something, how they could think such a thing, looking at things with the eyes of others, being willing to take a walk, however short, in, in the shoes of others. I owe that in great part to role-playing games. Being willing to explore creativity in a positive way uh, through, through writing or storytelling or teaching all comes down to role-playing games. Question three is who introduced you to role-playing games and what was your first experience like playing them? I have a video on the channel already about uh, the first time I ran a game, which was only my second session. And that gives you an idea, I guess, of what my first experience was like in playing them. Uh, it was very cooperative and collaborative. And I was introduced to role playing uh, by a friend I met in junior high, and he didn't fit the, you know, the typical or stereotypical early 80s gamer. This was in 1983, and, and you know, the group of people I played with in the beginning didn't either. I mean, these weren't basement dwellers. These these weren't uh, people who weren't uh, into sports or, or into social activities. Uh, you know, he loved music. He loved sports. He had a huge family. He was always active. He was one of the first people to, to do things. Um, he had a passion for acting. He had a lot of interests and he followed them up. He an excellent photographer. <laughs> he had interests and he pursued them and he stuck with some and he stuck with things like role-playing games and we bonded on some things and not on others but on role-playing we definitely gelled and we did a lot of, of great gaming together uh, making up our own rule systems and trying new ways to play uh, with and without dice and and, uh, and it was great fun. The first game was right out of the back of, of the rules. And, uh, you know, other people my age know exactly what I'm talking about. This kind of partially completed cave complex. And, uh, and I loved it right from the beginning. My, my first character had an overly grandiose name and I worked really hard over the, that character's career uh, to make them earn it <laughs> and, uh, have always tried to, because of that experience, I've always tried to get a clearer sense of what a starting character is in the game. And, uh, 
match my expectations to what the game is actually delivering. And that has made it really easy for me to explore lots of different games and, and keep gaming uh, an active part of my life. Fewer frustrations, fewer disappointments in terms of, of character and system clashing, I guess. Question four is, what was your first experience like running a game? Well, I have, as I mentioned earlier, a video detailing that, uh, that whole experience. What was it like? Um, I guess a word I would use now is intoxicating. Um, it got me going on all levels. It was satisfying in a way that reading wasn't, that movies weren't, that the TV shows weren't. Uh, that just, you know, sitting around talking with your friends wasn't it it was fully engaging the non-player characters uh, kept taking on life and threatening to become player characters the actual player characters in the session would amuse and astound and confound me and get me using you know every level and layer of my brain to make the experience seem real and for a long time, we went in that direction, trying, trying to make things more and more realistic. And later on, we discovered making things more and more like a type of story, like a genre. And everything that I got uh, of value as, as a gamer had its root in, in playing, you know, early red box D and D from from the eighties. Um, it was hard enough to understand that it seemed worth the struggle and it was simple enough that once you did understand it, it felt limitless. Now, of course, D&D wouldn't end up being my game of choice or even my style of gaming of choice, but without it, I could not be the gamer that I am today. Question five is what was it like designing your own system? And I wonder, I'm going to, I'm curious about the responses to this question. You know, how many of us have actually tried designing our own system? I've designed a lot over the years, but it's never been a, a really big interest of mine. Um, one of the things that I did very, very early was, you know, in isolation, never having seen or, or, heard anything like it before was to to invent step dice you know where uh, as a low level of ability you might have a d4 and then a little better you might have a d6 things like you see in in savage worlds or, or cortex um I'm, I'm curious how many people out there stumbled across that idea of their own and uh, and why it took so long for it to appear in in published works that that lots of people saw. Uh, what was it like designing my own system? It was usually very satisfying and developing it to the point where I still liked it when I was ready to share it was also very satisfying, significantly rarer, of course. And then seeing players engage with the system uh, and find it to work and not instantly come at you with, well, how about this? Or I don't like that. Uh, it, was, it was nice. I liked it. I didn't like it enough to continue doing it. And question six is more the direction where most of my gaming uh, has been focused. Question six, what was it like making your own setting? Well, we can go all the way back to question four with uh, what was your first experience like running a game? Designing my own setting has always been, you know, a whole brain activity with a full body response kind of thing. It's intoxicating. It It's something that I enjoy filling my leisure hours with when we're out walking the dogs, when I'm cooking in the kitchen, uh, when I'm commuting and, you know, can't talk over things with, with my wife or with, with friends. This keeps me company. Settings are always moving somewhere in the back of my mind. And starting from whatever that initial building block is and seeing it spawn other ideas and seeing those ideas coalesce into coherence and seeing that coherence spread out and twist and alter 
and almost feel like a living thing in your imagination. I can't imagine not wanting to do that. What was it like making your own setting? It has always been incredibly satisfying. Question number seven is one I don't entirely agree with, although I do agree with parts of it. Why do you think tabletop role-playing games are not known about by a good many people in the public? I would agree that they're not as popular as we might like, and I would agree that not as many people have played them as have heard of them. But I think that, by and large, the idea of the role-playing game has entered into the public lexicon. But the likelihood of you meeting someone who has actually played long enough that you could consider them a role player, that's pretty rare. You might find them gathered together in certain industries, or you might get, find them gathered together at certain events, uh, or you might have to search long and hard to find them. We're out there, and we're out there all over the world. Sometimes there aren't very many of us in one place, but I think tabletop role-playing games are known. That they haven't been played, I suppose, is can be laid at the door of two things. How they have been marketed and the people that responded to that marketing, how they chose to share them with others. And in both cases, they were marketed to a very specific group, such as, you know, through ads in comic books. If you weren't reading comic books, you weren't going to see the ads. Through Saturday morning cartoons. If you're not watching those cartoons, you're not going to be exposed to those ideas. Uh, so they were marketed primarily to kids, and kids grow up and leave certain things behind. A lot of those kids who have grown up are now coming back to gaming, and they're going to introduce their kids to it, which is an entirely different thing. Growing up in a family that games is very different than being a child who sees an ad in a comic book and sends away with their self-addressed stamped envelope to get some rules in the mail. So we'll see what happens in the future with this. And as for the other aspect, a lot of gamers have the stereotype of being shy, no doubt for a reason. It's hard for shy people to open up their homes and invite people in to dream and imagine together. But that's changing too. Question eight. What is an RPG and why are these types of games fun? Well, people have been fighting about what is an RPG for a very, very long time. And there's people who just want the answer to be, you know, a one sentence simple answer. And there's people who want to write endless treatises funded by academia in order to get to the bottom of it. Uh, I'm neither <laughs> of those. I don't think we can sum it up in a sentence and I don't want to read a several hundred page uh, academic treatise on what role-playing is. What do I think a role-playing game is? I like to stick with the term when I can. It is a game meaning there's risk and reward, there's consequences, there are, there are rules that help shape the experience, and it's in some way interactive. There are things to be overcome, there are benefits for overcoming them, there's risks for not overcoming them, that aspect of game culture. There's teamwork, there's that aspect of game culture. Uh, and the better you understand the game, the better experience you can expect to get out of it. All of those aspects of game I respond to in role-playing game. So role-playing, taking on a role for fun. I don't see it as acting. I don't see it as therapy. I see it as an opportunity to look at hypothetical situations and experiment with responses. I could 
enter the game as an avatar of myself or a caricature of myself or as my perception of a famous character or as my perception of a type of character, healthy, unhealthy, a fighter, a talker, a lover, a peacemaker, a starfarer, a pilot, you know, taking on a role. And that also has aspects as I see it. I can take on a role and take on a duty with that role of performing that role so that the other people at the table are entertained. Or I can take on that role and have it primarily be a vehicle for exploration for myself, where my interaction with the people at the table is, is just me playing a game and just them playing a game. But my experience of the game is mostly internal and my appreciation of character is what I can glean between the lines of what the other characters say, how the other characters react, and, and so on. There are many, many ways to experience a role-playing game, and that gets in our way of defining it. <laughs> the word spectrum gets overused on this channel, I'm sure, but that is how I see it. We have a broad spectrum of people who play a broad spectrum of games in a broad spectrum of styles with a broad spectrum of awareness of what all of that entails and can mean. There are people who pick up a game and have to learn it by themselves in total isolation with just a few other people who are equally in the dark. And the culture they create for themselves, if they enjoy it, they will continue it. When they meet other gamers, there can be cooperation, collaboration, expansion, or there can be clashes. That's human nature. Role-playing is many things to many people, and it doesn't have to be one thing to each person either. It's a question without an end, perhaps. But in an, in an effort to make my answer as simple as possible, it is a group activity bound by rules intended to be fun where the players can take on, if they choose, the personas of other people in worlds which may or may not ever exist and explore. Question nine is about sharing the hobby. Nine says, if you were going to teach a new player how to play role-playing games, how would you go about doing that? Well, I'm an educator and trainer by trade. So the very first thing I'd want to do is establish a connection with that new person so that I have better insight into how they deal with new ideas, basically how they learn, and arrange everything else that follows in accordance to how they are most comfortable learning and trying new things, especially because this is a group activity. I find the easiest way to do all of this is to start with discussing the setting. To a beginner, the rules mean nothing. So I don't waste a lot of time talking about them unless they need to bring some kind of equipment. So just show up on game day and play. That works for some people. But I like to have time to get to know people first and set a first game session several days or weeks in the future. Get talking about the setting, get them excited about the setting or build a connection between their pre-existing uh, excitement for that setting or genre and connecting it to how that's expressed in the game. Then build characters. Building characters teaches system. Building characters helps you learn more about what they're interested in, what they're definitely not interested in, um, how they see themselves, how they are imagining the character, working through so they have an understanding of what to, spec what to expect from that, that introductory capability that comes with that, with that freshly made character. Getting everybody talking about their characters, and again, building that excitement for the setting plus those characters 
plus the cool things that you can do with this game. Then we have a discussion prior to the first session about how things are going to start. What kind of environment will it be? Will I be starting in the middle of action? Uh, will they be being hired for a job? Will they be fleeing from a disaster? That kind of thing. How is it going to start so they can prepare themselves? And then the first session, model the behavior I want to see from the group. Now, if it's a new game for all of us, then that will include being solely responsible for learning and teaching the game. Books will be open on the table, and we as a group will answer any questions we have, take as much time as we need to go through those books and make sure that we do it right the first time. We understand why the game works the way it does. If we can't quite get it, we're willing to talk about it. And even if this means we have a slow first session, we're building a group identity. We come together to play this game. This is how we play it. And our purpose is to have fun. Approaching it that way has worked for me for a very long time. I like the connections it builds between people. I like how it pushes ownership of mastery of the game out into the group and becomes a shared thing or we can just discuss problems that might arise with rules interpretation or misunderstanding or the effect of new rules that get added later on it just has nothing but positive effects so that's how i approach teaching new gamers question 10 is really interesting and i'm not in a position to really answer it i'm not sure who would be but I'll give my thoughts as requested. What age group do you think plays these games more than other age groups? I think the knee-jerk reaction would be to, to flash back to when you started and when you played the most and assume that that will be true for everybody. Uh, and there's some logic behind that if you started as a teenager. You know, they've got the most time, they have... Uh, the, the easiest access to friends and and whatnot. But today's teenager has grown up with amazing video games in very portable packages. Does the, the lure of the tabletop and the extra work required, fun work though it is, does the extra work required compete with playing with your friends online in some sort of video game? It's a question. When we look at pictures of things like Gen Con and other gaming conventions, are we seeing lots and lots of young teenagers? Are we seeing lots and lots of gray beards? Are we seeing, you know, the middle-aged? or some sort of mix? Do conventions represent just a small portion of our hobby? Just the ones who are able to go, the ones with the, the income and the leisure time to be able to go. Is that why the images seem to skew toward an older demographic? Who can say? People that I game with have always tended to be around my age. Does that mean that gamers are aging? Or does it mean that we tend to associate with people around our own age. I think this is a, an excellent question that deserves some research. And I hope that as gamers age and build their families that they're passing the hobby on in a fun way to their kids. Uh, but time will tell there. Question 11 is another challenging question and one that I, I don't entirely like. What overall benefits do you think a person that plays role-playing games has that perhaps a non-gamer wouldn't have or would have less of? You know, we talk a lot about the advantages of gaming, sometimes as a justification for it. You know, oh, it'll, it'll, it develops social skills, it develops math skills, it develops empathy. Okay, so if it develops empathy, maybe it can help us to stop building groups like this. Um, 
there are lots of activities that have lots of spin-off effects. This is one activity that has certain advantages in developing skills. But I can develop teamwork in other ways. I can develop empathy in other ways. I can develop math skills in other ways. Planning, coordination, all of these things I can experience in other ways. And I don't necessarily get them from role-playing games in a greater or lesser degree than in other. I might get them in a different mix than I would from doing something else. But I personally wouldn't have developed those skills without this activity. And that I find to be significant. Do I feel that there are benefits that role-playing gamers have that non-gamers don't have. I'm not really sure I, that I would, I would commit to that. But a person who's only going to experience being challenged in those areas and therefore having to develop in those areas, who is very insular, who has difficulty communicating with others or difficulty forming bonds or, or doing physical activities that, that lead to teamwork and, and group activity. Someone who is only ever going to be exposed to these skills through something like role-playing games. Do they have an advantage over their friend who didn't get exposed to it or was afraid to try? Definitely. They definitely do. Have you ever seen a role-playing game session break out in any violence, is how question 12 begins, and this is a huge surprise to me that it has to be asked. I mean, perhaps this is a connection to the idea of, of certain people out there in our community wanting to make conventions and events at game stores safer places for all ages and all types of people. So. I guess that's where this question is coming from. Have you ever seen a role-playing game session break out in any violence, or have you ever seen with your own eyes people becoming more violent after playing RPGs? No, I've, I've never seen it, experienced it. I've never met anybody who told me a story about it happening. Um, I find that violence can be a solution in the game. And violence tends to be the easiest solution in a game geared toward violence. So a group of people playing Call of Cthulhu in an investigation are less likely to use violence as a solution to their problem. You know, they can shoot up the library if they want but that violence is not going to get them the answer to their question. Only reading the books is going to do that. As opposed to exploring a dungeon in any one of the numerous fantasy-based games where you know you're going to meet violent opposition. There are monsters lurking in the darkness. You have to be prepared to deal with them violently. Violence can be a solution in the game, but the game is not violence. The game can be violent. But the game itself is not violence. The game is a group of people sitting around talking about violence, expressing violence, imagining violence. And I find that exposure to an idea can have benefits, even if it's a negative idea, if what you do with that idea is talk about it with other people, all of whom have different viewpoints. I don't find that the game encourages violence outside of the imaginary situations proposed within it. And I find that as gamers mature, that other options tend to present themselves. Now, when Dungeons & Dragons was new, for example, the game was far more lethal violence as a solution to every problem is ridiculous. Finding other solutions to this potentially violent situation was how people had to learn to play the game. 
Yes, they were carrying swords, but they were also carrying bags of nails to create barricades, to redirect the monsters that lurk in the darkness. A game full of easily violent solutions where all problems are nails to be hammered is going to give people a lot of exposure to violence. More exposure than what they see on television, more exposure than what they're reading in books, more exposure than the news that surround them every day, more exposure than the hallways of their high schools or junior highs, more violence than on the city streets or the town streets around their houses. Let's just leave it as a question. Question 13, the last question is, have you, or do you think role-playing games are still seen as much of a negative thing as they once were? No, I don't think they are. I think the, the growth of the hobby into computer gaming and the overlap with board games and card games, the ability of these games to cross generation gaps, to cross culture gaps, to cross language gaps. I don't see that whatever was perceived about them as being negative really survives contact anymore. It might bother a single gamer personally that other people around them cast aspersions on their hobby, but this is true of pretty much anything else. They might not like your shirt either. So uh, it's something that you're going to have to grow up and deal with. So are role-playing games automatically seen as negative? The Satanic Panic is as behind us as it's going to be. Uh, the idea of only nerds play those games down in their fetid basements. Uh, the community can perpetuate that stereotype if it likes. Uh, I've never been a part of that stereotype, and the people I've gamed with haven't been a part of that stereotype. So I'm not sure who's exactly responsible for that stereotype. So that negative can die as soon as we let it. Yeah. More and more people in positions of authority, more and more people who are writing for mainstream uh, magazines or online publications that people read and enjoy who might not necessarily be gamers are coming out and revealing the benefits or singing the praises of this kind of activity. Whatever was negative about it in the past is being erased. That never need to return. Okay, those are my 13 responses to Tim's 13 questions. I'm going to go look for other video responses now to see what other people have been saying. And I hope that when Tim has finished writing his paper, he'll share it with us so we can see how he compiled all of these things and filtered it through his own personal experience. It's always nice when Tim releases a video where he talks about gaming and its effect on his life or its, its, its role in his life and, and the people that he meets while doing it. And, uh, Long may his channel continue. If you enjoy this kind of question and answer and you have your own YouTube channel as a long-term participant in this sort of thing, I encourage you to think of some questions which mean something to you. And don't be in a hurry to answer them yourself. Just ask them to the community. Share them out there. Post the links on our Facebook group, on our G Plus groups. Put it out there and encourage people to respond to you and share and respond to each other. That builds community. That exposes truth. That pushes aside the mono conversation that tends to come up uh, in groups where we all start talking about one particular game or start complaining about one particular thing. Right? Change the conversation. Change the topic. Expose the kind of things that you really enjoy. Share them. Appreciate what other people are sharing. And that's great. And if you like this kind of positive environment of sharing ideas, exchanging ideas, commenting on them, and learning what other people are thinking, then 
get ready for August because RPG a day is returning and I'm going to be a big part of that, which is kind of exciting for me. RPG a day is a month long blogging and vlogging opportunity. I'm not going to call it a challenge or a carnival where the pressure is on to answer every post every day, but this is something to participate in, to share. There will be 31 questions in the month of August, which ask you to discuss something about your gaming life, some positive thing to share some aspect of it with the greater community and beyond and share them as far and as wide as you can. So if you liked this kind of thing, help me make something special out of RPG a day coming up in August.